part two of lecture seven for MEC 4418. We were talking about the, the differences in a rather peculiar control system that ended up giving us a transfer function with only one pole in it, S plus one, and was showing about how, if we look at it from a state space point of view, that if we converted it into a sort of canonical system with x1 bar, x2 bar, x3 bar, x4 bar, representing sort of a state of our system, and that we could see uh, different phenomena associated with controllability and observability. And these concepts are particularly isolated to uh, state space analysis of control systems. Generally, if a system has any uncontrollable subsystems, the entire system is said to be uncontrollable. The reason is, is that if there's any parts of it that are uncontrollable, then what use is the entire system? Similarly, if the system has any unobservable subsystems, the system itself can be said to be unobservable. The previous example was stable, with all of its poles in the left-hand plane, and for that matter, all of the zeros. But what if parts of the system were stable, particularly an unobservable or uncontrollable part. So perhaps some of the system is unstable. And what would happen if it was unobservable or, or uncontrollable? A system where the uncontrollable part is stable is said to be stabilizable. It's a nice, long, and ridiculously word spelled term. But that's what it's called. A system where the unobservable part is stable is called detectable. So you might say a system where the uncontrollable part is is stable. And if it's both uncontrollable and unobservable, we'd say it's stabilizable and detectable. In a sense, what we're saying is, is that that uncontrollable and unobservable part, maybe we don't need to pay any attention to it. And in most dynamic systems, uh, especially complex ones, we have stabilizable and detectable components. And you might wonder, well, does this just happen, happen in lecture notes? And the answer to that question is, is no, it actually really does exist. Uncontrollability? Well, it appears from, say, redundant state variables. If you have too many state variables in your system, they'll show up as redundancies. In other words, one row will be linearly dependent upon another. Notice the first and third rows here, 103 and 206. They're related to each other. Physically uncontrollable systems in the two cart system at right, for example. There's no way to, to move the center of mass by applying force F to each mass. So, for example, if you can see here, between these two masses, that if we apply a force equally against the insides of either cart, then there's no way to actually move the center of mass. You can move the, each of these masses farther away from the center of mass or closer to the center of mass but you're not going to move the center of mass itself. If you have too much symmetry in the system, if R1, C1 is equal to R2, C2, up here in this electrical circuit, for example, R1, C1 is equal to R2, C2, we can't control the voltage across R3 via E0 because these will cancel themselves out. There's other examples of uncontrollability in this PDF, more examples of uncontrollability that you can take a look at. If you have uncontrollable parts and they happen to be unstable, that's, un that's a lot of trouble. Let's take a look at an example. In other words, how not to control an unstable system, an inverted pendulum. Okay. So there are a lot of ways to design good control systems for unstable processes. This is not one of them. What we have is an inverted pendulum here at right, where we have an input force that moves the cart back and forth, and that controls what the angle of this pendulum is, what the angular rate of the pendulum, I should say, is, theta dot, what its angular position is, theta, and then this omega squared comes back, that's due to the inertia of the system. And we get our output y. And the y is theta. The compensator tells us what our f should be based on u. And this u it actually has a feed forward component in it with a minus sign. 
that's an integral of u itself. So if we think about the inverted pendulum, with the output being the measure position, like we're showing, the transfer function from the input to the output is 1 over s plus omega times s minus omega. This s minus omega it part, if omega it's itself is assumed to be uh, greater than, uh, assumed to be positive, then this will be uh, the negative, the positive pole, meaning the system will have a pole in the right-hand plane, and so the system's unstable. If omega is said to be less than zero, then of course this would be the unstable pole. In any case, this is obviously unstable, and a much better transfer function might be 1 over s times s plus omega. We'd have a neutrally a marginally stable pole here at the origin, and then we'd have s plus omega, which would be a stable pole. Fortunately, with this s as well, we'd have a type 1 system, and we'd have a zero steady state error without any compensation. So one thing we could do is to use a compensator having a transfer function s minus omega bar, say, divided by s, and you notice that if we multiplied this transfer function, 1 over the original, sorry, 1 over s plus omega times s minus omega, by this, then this s minus omega bar, if omega bar is equal to omega up here, then that cancels out with this. We cancel a pole with a zero, and then we divide by s, and we'd end up having the transfer function that we would want. The problem of it is, is that it's really difficult to make omega bar precisely equal to omega. So this comes from our compensator, and this is the actual dynamic system itself, and the compensation is, would not be perfect. That's always the problem with pole zero compensation, by the way. It's never perfect, and if it's not, then it could cause you lots of problems. But that's not actually the real problem here. The real problem is what happens if we can see. This compensator transfer function represents proportional plus integral, so it's p and i compensation, which is customary, and it's not, not an unusual process, and it actually gives you a type 1 system out of a type 0 system, as you know. And the transfer function of the compensated system, if we go ahead and multiply everything out, is s minus omega bar divided by s times quantity s squared minus omega bar squared. If we don't sit, okay, and that goes to h as omega bar goes to omega. The state space equations representing this, uh, representing this system be equal to x1 dot is equal to x2. x2 dot is equal to omega squared x1 minus x3 plus, plus u. And then x3 dot is equal to omega bar times u. And you can figure this out from your transfer function because this has to be equal to c times si minus a, the inverse of that, I should say, times b. X3 is the state of the integrator and the compensator in this case. And if we write out the matrices and we end up with zeros down the diagonal, and then we have just above the diagonal the 1 and minus 1, and then omega squared over on here on the left-hand side. B has 0, 1, omega bar multiplied against the U, and then, as usual, the D is equal to, to 0, and we'll talk about C in a moment. And we can transfer the A matrix to diagonal form by using a transformation matrix, and the way to figure this out is really kind of beyond the, the importance here of this particular lecture. But in any case, if we do that, we can figure out that A bar is equal to T times A times T minus 1 to transform our, our A matrix to diagonal form, and we get omega minus omega 0. And B is cap omega minus the omega bar with minus sign in front on the second row with omega plus bar omega and then two omega bar on the last row. So here's our system as it's written out. We'd have u is equal to this top term omega minus omega bar over two omega squared goes in to our system with x1 bar and x2 bar on the second system omega plus omega bar over two omega bar squared and we'd have minuses here on both sides. And then we'd have x3, which is just omega bar over omega squared, and it goes straight out to y. x1 plus x2 plus x3 all together gives us our output. Again, a single input, single output system, of course. 
So as omega bar goes to omega, if you look at the block diagram, the connection between the control input and the unstable state x1 is broken. So if we assume that that omega is actually greater than zero, notice we have a plus here. This isn't negative state feedback, this is actually positive. This is going to be an unstable loop. It's associated with that pole that's in the right hand plane. As omega bar goes to, to equal omega, we lose the ability to control this system. And so it stops being stabilizable. It's still observable, but it's not stabilizable. Furthermore, it's, it's not stable in any case. And so what we might call this is a good question in any rate. So the problem of it is, is that when you actually have a pole zero cancellation, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good thing. What it actually indicates in this case is that, yeah, you do have a pole zero cancellation, but it renders a part of your system uncontrollable. And since that part of the system happens to also be unstable, it's unstabilizable. The system would have a pole zero cancellation, but it would still be a system that wouldn't work for you. So let's talk about the definition of controllability and observability. The formal definition is given here. If the degree of the transfer function is less than the order of the steady state representation, there is a problem. The definition of a controllability is this. A system is controllable if and only if it is possible via the input to change the system from an initial state x at time t to any other state x at cap t in a fin finite time t minus t is greater than or equal to zero. So if we can change it from an initial state to any other state in a finite time, it's controllable. In other words, a system is controllable if and only if this matrix is non-singular from some t, cap t is greater than little t. Notice the complexity of it, and you'll find that it has a state transfer matrix in here. State transfer matrix of t to lambda times b of lambda times transverse, transpose I should say, of b of lambda times the transpose of the state transfer matrix again at t and lambda with lambda as a dummy variable for time from little t to cap t. If that's non-singular, then the system is said to be controllable. Very helpful, isn't it? If you look at observability, we can have a similar type of, of formal definition. If the degree of the transfer function is less than the order of the steady state representation, there is a problem. In other words, if we have a formal definition, a system is, is observable if and only if it is possible via the output to determine the system's initial state x at some time t from only the output y at some time tau in a finite time t tau and cap t as shown here. That what that really means is, is that a system is, is a system is observable if only if the matrix cap m, which is the state transfer matrix again, uh, from lambda to time t times the C matrix this time with a transpose of at lambda times C lambda times the state transfer matrix at lambda to t with lambda as the dummy variable in time from little t to cap t. As long as this matrix is non-singular for some time t greater than cap t from greater than little t, the system could be said to be observable. So let's talk about a usable definition for controllability. Because can you imagine trying to use these integrals just to see if your system is controllable and observable? The answer is no, you don't have to use the integrals. You can just look at the rank of the controllability test matrix, it's called. Q, for example, and what we do is we take B and we augment that on the right hand side. We place against that on the right hand side A times B and put against that A squared times B, so A times A times B, A times A times A times B, and these form columns. And once we get out 
to a to the n minus 1 power times b, the order of the system, then it should be, we can assess whether it's controllable or not. If the rank of this matrix is equal to the order of the system, it's controllable. So if you have four variables in your state space representation, and the rank of this matrix is equal to four, then it's controllable. So the matrix Q has n rows and n times m columns, and where m is the number of inputs. So the rank of this Q matrix has to be less than or equal to n. So no matter what we do, it has to be less than or equal to the number of, uh, of, of variables we're using for our system. Again, if the rank is equal to n, the system is said to be controllable. If the rank is less than n, it's uncontrollable. No more, no less. So let's look. The state space matrices from our first example. Well, we had them shown here, A, B, and C. When you look at controllability, well, first column is just B. We just take it from here. 1 minus 2, 2 minus 1. And the second column is A times B, so it's 2, 3, 2, 1 times 1, 2, 2, 1. It goes in this first first part of this column, and we carry on the multiplication here at A times B, and we end up with the AB column, minus 1, 4, minus 6, 3, and then we multiply that, pre-multiply that with A, and we get AAB, and we get 1 minus 10, 18 minus 9, pre-multiply it again with A, and we end up with minus 1, 28, 54, with the minus sign in front, and 27. So the rank of this matrix is less than 4. How do I know this? Well, there's several different ways to check. One way to check is to take the <coughs> pardon me, the determinant of Q and assess if the determinant is singular. If the determinant is singular, the rank must be less than the size of this square matrix. Another way to check is to see if a row and another two sets of rows are similar to another, or linear combinations of some other rows, or if two columns, one column is a linear combination of some of the other columns. You have to check for linear dependence. Okay. So any of the columns of this matrix add up to zero. For example, you add up the column of the first matrix, 1 minus 2, 2 minus 1, and that adds up to zero. It's linearly independent. If it were linearly independent, you would not add up to zero for this column. The matrix is also singular, meaning the determinant would be equal to zero. Okay, so we know that the rank has to be less than four. In other words, the system is uncontrollable. We can do a similar sort of definition for observability. If the rank of the observability test matrix n is equal to c transpose, a transpose, c transpose, a transpose, a transpose, c transpose, so on and so forth, out to a transpose to the n minus 1 power times c transpose. If that all is equal to n, the order of the system, then it, the system itself could be said to be observable. The matrix n has n rows and np columns, where p is the number of outputs, so the rank of n should be less than or equal to n. And if it is, if it's actually equal to n, then the system is said to be observable. So it's very similar to the, what we're talking about with controllability. It's just how we define this is slightly different. Rather than having B, BA, triple BA, and so on and so forth, we have C transpose, A transpose, C transpose, and so on and so forth. So we're talking about the outputs. If the rank of this test matrix is less than the number of variables you're using in your state transfer matrix representation, the system is unobservable. And the state space matrices from our first example are shown here. And let's check for observability. Well, C transpose has 7642 shown in the first column of this matrix, followed by A transpose C transpose, minus 10, minus 9, minus 6, minus 3, a transpose, A transpose, C transpose. Well, that's 16, 15, 10, 5. And so on and so forth. You'll notice that how do we know that we have A, 
transpose to the third power? Well, n minus 1. Our n is equal to 4, because their A matrix is a 4 by 4 matrix. We know that we have four variables for our state space representation. So we know that n is equal to 4. So n minus 1, we have 3a to the t's here for our last column. This again has a rank of less than 4. And you can check the determinant, or you can check the whether rows are multiples of each other. And in fact, yeah, sure enough, they are. The second, third, and fourth rows are multiples of each other. Notice if I multiplied this last row by 2, I'd get the, the third row. If I multiplied this last row by 3, I'd get the second row. So that means that the, the rows are not linearly independent. The system cannot have a rank of 4. In other words, the matrix is singular, the determinant is 0, and the system is unobservable.